You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Trudy Truitt. Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website, your home on the web, where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great-looking professional website developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates. PubSite is the new easy-to-use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20 or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-Site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have Matt Ruff uh, on the show with me today. He has an amazing new novel. It's called 88 Names, and let me tell you guys something. This is one of my absolute favorites of the year uh, across any genre and 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 the book itself crosses a number of genres so it's a uh, it, it's such an amazing read and if you are sheltering at home like a lot of us are um this definitely needs to be in your read stack uh, welcome to the show matt well thank you very much and thank you for that introduction oh, you're you're welcome it was uh it was heartfelt and true um <laughs> if uh we begin each show with the same question each time, and uh, that is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? You know, I, my traditional answer to this is that I, I decided to be a writer when I was five years old, but reality is I don't really remember a time when I, I didn't want to do this. Um, I, I seem to have come wired from the factory for, you know, for this kind of thing, and I that was convenient in a lot of ways because it meant I, I spent my childhood sort of teaching myself how to write, you know, it was at a time when, when other people were paying for my food and lodging. So I got a lot of the, the bad writing that you inevitably do when you're starting out out of the way early on. And, um, you know, by the time I actually had to start paying for my own food, I, I had at least had about a decade and a half worth of practice under my belt. So that was, that's, that's a good way to do it if you can. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, were there any any writers that you idolized or wanted to emulate? Uh, like, who were some of the early voices that that influenced you? If you're a youngster who is practicing writing, you evidently are, are drawing on inspiration from from someone or from several people. More than likely, who were some of those early influences? Um, I, I mean, I, I, I think I owe a big debt to Stephen King. He loomed pretty large when I was younger. And I, I think in particular, the fact that, you know, he combines, um, genre writing with, but with really strong, believable characters, which I think is, uh, uh, something that it's, it's the reason he became as big as he did. It just felt like real people, but dealing with these, these crazy situations. And, and it's, it's an interesting 
sort of talking about crossing genres that, you know, a lot of genre books, it's, it's more about the plot and about the, the ideas, which can be great. But King added that extra level of people who felt real and, and, uh, you know, who you, you'd like, yeah, I know guys like this. Um, gosh. And I, I just read a lot of, I, I, I read all over the place. I just read anything that came to mind. Um, so I think King loomed large. And then later on, I, I became a big fan of John Crowley. Um, he's less well known, but he's a, he's probably my favorite writer today. He's most best known for a book called Little Big, which is a, um, it's a very weird story about this family that lives on the edge of a wild wood. Uh, and they have this very weird relationship with, with fairies in the wood. And it's, it's kind of hard to describe, but it's a wonderful, um, just beautiful uh, book. And so he's become a, a favorite writer. I think those are those are the two biggest influences on me. Um, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm also a big William Gibson fan from back in the day. Um, uh, really love Shirley Jackson. Um, I'm sorry she didn't live long enough to write more. Um, so, uh, yeah, those are those are like the the heavy hitters who come to mind right away. I think when um, when you went off to college, um, did you did you go with the intention of studying writing? Yeah, I well, it was funny. I I basically this was what I wanted to do, and so I think I, I I studied English with a concentration in creative writing, basically so I would get credit for what I was going to do anyway. Um, and in hindsight, that was a horribly impractical um, strategy because if if this had not worked out, if I had not been able to make a living as a writer, um, I I just I'm not the kind of person who would make a good teacher. I don't think so. Um, and there's really nothing else you could do with a creative writing uh, degree. So I, I probably would have wound up working, you know, uh, delivering pizzas or in a video store or something like that. I had no fallback plan. And I'm just very fortunate that it, it worked out. Um, on the flip side, I mean, that that is part of the way I got my career started. Um, one of my English professors was the novelist Alison Lurie. And uh my first novel, Fool in the Hill, is actually my senior thesis at Cornell. And uh, Allison, you know, read what I had written and she said, you know, when you finish this, uh, send it to my agent, Melanie Jackson in New York and see what she thinks. And so I did. And Melanie liked it and sold it uh, to Atlantic Monthly Press about six months after I graduated. And from there, I was kind of on my way. And uh, so that chance meeting, you know, that connection with Alison Lurie basically justified my four years at Cornell. But again, it was just this weird circumstance of luck. If I had not taken her class, if I had, you know, I, yeah, I probably wow. be living out in the woods somewhere in a shack. <laughs> I love that story though. Um, you know, you just, and, and I hear these stories over and over and over, you know, nearly 850 episodes Everyone has a different story, and I'm just always amazed at the serendipity, the the, mm -hmm. the being in the right place at the right time, or people having the courage to say yes um, when opportunities come along, um, when you just as easily could have ignored the opportunity or said no or not taken a chance. And I, I just love these stories. It's a, a, I love hearing people's journey to success. Yeah, I, I mean, I, it, again, though, you know, it's like looking back, it's like if I had it to do over, I think I definitely would have would have tried to make a plan B. But and I, I always encourage younger writers to think that way, because the thing is, there there are for every every one where the serendipity worked out. I knew people at Cornell who were, you know, at least as talented as I was, maybe more so. But um they they got tired of being poor before they got that lucky break and they ended up doing other things with their lives. And so uh, I'm I'm conscious of how lucky I was. But if you're if you're still on the other end of this, it's it's very helpful to think, you know, what can I do as a backup plan to allow myself to continue to eat and, and a job that will leave me enough time and energy to want to write? Because most of the jobs you fall into you know, at, at, at the 11th hour, because you just, you need to get some job or not the kind of jobs that are going to leave you a lot of energy left over at the end of the day. So, uh, you know, and, and again, I, I mean, it's easy for me to talk because I'm, I'm super impractical. And even if I did have it to do over again, I'm sure I would, <laughs> I would still be, be banking on luck. But if you can, if you can plan a little better than I did, then you, you should. 
Well, a lot of people, serendipity is fueled by uh, a lot of years grinding away at something that, that they would rather not be doing. That's true. Yeah. So, you know, take it as it comes. It's, uh, but uh, I, I think that's pretty sound advice. If you can, and if you can find a way to work with words, um, you know, a lot of people go in, into publishing and, and work in the, on the editorial side or, you know, as a freelance editor, there's lots of, of people have different paths. And, uh, you know, it's a pretty great time to, uh, and except for, you know, the coronavirus stuff, uh, it's pretty great. You don't time really, to, you don't, you didn't really want to be in New York right yeah, now, but yeah. Right. <laughs> well, that's, that's why it's great to be a freelance, you know, person yeah. who can do that. But anyway, so, so that book became your first uh, published book. Uh, do you remember that the origins of that story, where, where that, that story first came to you? Well, it, it, part of it was I, you know, one of the reasons I went to Cornell is when I went up to visit it, I fell in love with the campus. It's just a physically beautiful, um, it's set on a hill in, you know, upstate New York, uh, and the, there are gorges that cut through the campus. And so it's just, it's just a physically amazing place. And, I wanted to set a story there, and and Cornell actually became kind of a character in the novel. Um, but then the rest of it, I had a bunch of different ideas for stories that didn't add up to novels on their own. And I one day just had this idea to put them all together because a, a college is a place where different people and and you know and things come together and and uh, just sort of put them together in and make a, a sort of conglomerated story about that. So there was a story about uh, talking animals attending this college. There was a talking uh, a story about these these sort of Shakespearean fairies living in the bell tower at the campus. Uh, there was a story about a, a group of sort of modern day, you know, knights named the Bohemians who you know, were sort of inspired in part by some of the, the people I, I was in a dorm with. And, uh, Framing this all was a story about uh, a Greek god who visits the campus and sort of gets into a, a bet with a human writer about, um, uh, you know, ha ha controlling a story and making and sort of he this this guy this this Greek god it's the Greek god Apollo, but he goes by the name of Mister Sunshine, who likes to come down to earth and sort of storytell using real people's lives and sort of he gets into a, a sort of a contest with a human writer Stephen George who lives on the campus and that's sort of how I tied all of these threads together and this is a sort of kitchen sink approach that really shouldn't have worked but it, it turned out I had a knack for taking very diverse story ideas and connecting them in a way that made sense and was fun and um, so that is that is sort of how it came together and um, from there, I was just, you know, that, that, that got me started. Well, and, and you've kind of taken that theme of, of being able to stitch together, uh, very diverse, uh, things, multi-genre things, uh, a, a lot of times and make a fun, engaging story out of it. Um, uh, Lovecraft country comes immediately to mind, um, yeah. as, as something that is, it is so bigger than life and out there and completely accessible all at the same time. Um, where does a story like that come from? That was, it was funny. That was actually, uh, it started out as a, as a TV series pitch. I wanted to do my own version of the X files. And, um, one of the things you have to do if you're going to do an X-Files story is you have this recurring group of characters having weekly paranormal adventures is you sort of figure out, well, what job do these people have that has them, you know, constantly running into monsters? And um, basically, I came up with the idea. I had I had read about the Green Book, this, um, you know, Jim Crow era guide for African-American travelers that would list hotels and restaurants across the U.S. that um, – would accept black customers. And I was fascinated by that. So I hit on the idea that, well, what if, you know, instead of white FBI agents in the 1990s, you had an X-Files where the, the, the Mulder, the Fox Mulder character was a sort of field researcher for a fictional black travel guide, somebody whose job was to drive around the country looking for places that would take him in. And, and I had the idea of sort of making this guy also be sort of a nerd, somebody who read science fiction and fantasy and weird tales and loved that stuff, even though in those days the genre really did not love African-Americans back. And uh, somebody who, you know, if he if he 
encountered a vampire or, you know, the Loch Ness monster running across the highway or whatever would, would have the genre savvy to know how to deal with that. And then at the same time would be dealing with the more mundane horrors of uh, racism and segregation and have those two themes sort of play off against each other. And, um, uh, I, I couldn't get the, the TV people I was talking to, to to go on with this, but I decided to try and make it work as a novel and came up with the idea of telling a sort of episodic story where each chapter would be both a sort of standalone weird tale starring one of the the, the, the black protagonists that in this family that own this travel agency. And it was also part of a larger arc story. And again, very much an X-Files type thing about the, the relationship between my main protagonist, Atticus Turner, and um, this weird family of wizards from New England. So, um, and uh, yeah, I, uh, I managed to make that work as a book and then sort of time come round. Now that once the book came out, I, that became a proof of concept for uh, what is now going to be an HBO series. So... Um, yeah, so that was a, that was a neat adventure and, and that was a lot of fun in terms of coming up with the individual stories and figuring out how they would all fit together. So yeah, again, very much playing to my kind of my strengths for that. Well, in, in, in the tradition of, of Stephen King, you've got, um, a, a little bit of horror, uh, some fantasy, uh, borders on sci-fi, uh, mm-hmm. but all encapsulated in these folksy accessible characters um when you start thinking about characters what what are some of the the traits um that you go to that help uh to make characters that readers easily fall in love with or or really despise you know what to, to 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 get an emotional response from readers i guess is what i'm saying yeah, it's it's really for me an intuitive process. I mean, and, and it it varies where I some characters you just get immediately. Like the the main character in Lovecraft Country, Atticus Turner, was is born out of this idea of he's the opening scene. He's he's driving home to Chicago. He's gotten this weird letter from his dad, and uh, he's pulled over by a state trooper, and uh, you know the guy basically searches his trunk and finds this big box of science fiction books. And he wants to know, well, what's a black guy doing with a bunch of science fiction? Is this really your car? And that was sort of the opening, the opening idea of Atticus being pulled over and being forced to explain, yes, I'm a nerd and I'm also a veteran. And, and, you know, why are you hassling me? And that was sort of encapsulated his character in his life very easily. And, and so he was, he was just came as a natural. And then, Working out from there, like, you know, who who his dad would be and uh, the other members of the family. And and I figure out what role each character is going to play in the novel. And then I think about their backstories, you know, who are they, what moves them. Um, and again, sometimes it's instantaneous. You just know who somebody is. And then in other cases, you wrestle a little more with um, figuring out exactly – who they are and who they're going to be. And, and often what will happen is I'll, I'll be writing and I'll reach a point in the story where plot wise, something needs to happen. And so I know why I want a character to do a certain thing, but um, I have to figure out why they would do it. Um, and it's sort of the, the horror is good for explaining this because in, in the horror novels, of course, you, you, people are constantly doing things that a sane person wouldn't do. Like, yes, yeah, so I'm going to go down to the basement alone now with this, flashlight that isn't working very well. And it's like, well, why, why are you doing that? And, um, often in answering that question, you, you learn more about the character and, and, and who they are. So, um, one of the stories in Lovecraft country, for example, uh, one of the chapters is about, um, a friend of Atticus's name, uh, Letitia Dandridge. And she comes into some money and decides she wants to buy a house and, and become a landlady. Um, and, to get the the kind of house she really wants, she's going to buy in a white neighborhood. Uh, she gets this incredibly good deal on a, what turns out to be a haunted mansion in a all white neighborhood. And so she ends up dealing both with uh, this ghost that doesn't want her there and white neighbors who don't want her there either and want to burn her out. And she's got to figure out a way to play the dead off against the living to keep what's hers. And, you know, most of us, if you, find you've purchased a haunted house. The obvious question is why would you stay? And part of the answer here is because, yeah, she's, she's, 
she's a black woman in the 1950s, so she cannot get a traditional mortgage. She's got a buy-on contract, which basically means that um, it's set up like a mortgage, but she doesn't actually own the house until the mortgage or until the contract is completely paid off. And if she runs, if she abandons the house, then she loses everything. She loses the house and she loses all the money she's invested. So it's like buying a house on layaway. Yeah, basically. <laughs> and so it's sort of like it, it, just thinking about, you know, that what would, you know, the, the, just the pressure on her. This is her one chance to have what she wants. And then making, thinking more about too, about her history and what would give her the strength to go through with this and hang on. And, and, you know, she's just the kind of person who, uh, if, if she, if she believes enough in, in this is what I deserve, this is what I need. She'll, she'll hang on and do it and, and find the strength to do it. And so that's the kind of thing where, uh, that's the way it works for me is just, you, you sort of get the story going, get a sense of the character. And then if you run into this roadblock, like, okay, how do I, how do I get this person to do this weird thing? Then often the answer is, well, there's something in their personal history that will motivate that and make that possible. So. And, and finding those things in, in people's personal history, um, that's, that's a great way to, to link the reader to, to the character. Yeah, and it it just gives them more depth again than than sort of stock characters who just do what you do because the plot needs them to do it. And I think that's really the the important thing to me to keep my motivation separate from the character's motivation. So when I'm you know I, I know why 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 I want them to do it, but I need to know why they do. Right. Um, Matt, over your writing career, uh, from the fool on the hill to, um, to the new book, 88 names, you know, in, in between there, we've got Lovecraft country. We've got the Mirage bad monkeys, um, it set this house in order. It seems, you know, when you're looking, uh, across your catalog, um, that you enjoy reinventing yourself and your writing with each new project, uh, in, in a time where publishers really favor um, authors who write big series and, and, and ones that they can kind of anchor and then build upon. Um, what motivates you to keep doing new things with each new project? Well, part of it is I, I write very slowly. So by the time I'm done with each book, I've changed a lot and, and I'm just, yeah, I, I kind of fell into this by accident where I just, I have a lot of different interests and I've never really felt like I, I have to be bound to one particular genre. And I've been fortunate to have publishers who've been willing to give me my, my head and, and going where I want to go. That said, I am a nightmare for publicists, you know, trying to figure out, well, how do we position this guy? You know, it's like, cause I'm all over the map in terms of, of what I'm writing about. But, um, yeah, it's, it's just, I, I, I would be bored writing the same book every time or the same kind of book every time I think. And, uh, and I've been able to get away with, with not doing that. Um, when you, when you start thinking about a new project and, you know, in, in the early, early, early stages where it's just a, a kernel, um, just a, a germ of an idea, what is, how does it usually, um, start with you? Is it, is it a character, a particular character? Is it, um, you know, a unique plot device that maybe you're playing with, you know, how could I do this? Maybe is it a, a scene or a setting or is, is each thing different? This is a, yeah, this is another thing where they're the each, in each case it's different. Um, it, it, uh, like my second novel, sewer, gas and electric just started as a title. You know, I was, I was messing around at the Cornell bookstore one day when I should have been working on fool in the hill and, uh, instead was looking at, all of the fantasy trilogies that had been inspired by Lord of the Rings. And I started thinking to myself, well, what's the weirdest sounding title for a trilogy that might still be a good book? And one of the ones I came up with, this was the idea of, you know, the public works trilogy, sewer, gas and electric. And I had no idea what that would be about, except that it sort of created this vague notion in my head of some sort of futuristic metropolis. But the, the title stuck with me and, uh, as time went on, I would periodically think about that. And, and eventually other I sort of random ideas I had kind of started glomming on to that. And it, it evolved into an actual story. And that that's actually just one book. I kept the trilogy name, but um, it's it's one book with three sections, sewer, gas and electric. But um, 
and this is often what it is. I'll have, uh, you know, maybe a couple of different ideas will collide and I'll say, huh, well, what if I took this and added this to it? Um, Occasionally, it's it's something more fully formed, like my my novel "Set This House in Order." That was inspired by. Um, I've always been interested in multiple personality disorder, and um, before we got married, my wife and I used to have long talks on the phone. I was living up in Maine; uh, she was down in Philadelphia, and and one night, we somehow got on the subject of multiple personalities, and she mentioned that uh, she knew a guy, uh, Michael B, who was a multiple personality and rather than attempt to seek some sort of cure, he'd come up with this mechanism for um, coping. Uh, he basically created this imaginary house in his head where his different people could sort of all see and talk to one another and, uh, you know, negotiate uh, and cooperate. And I had never heard of that before. And it, it turned out that this was a common strategy among, among people who were multiple and, um, and that got better because Michael B. had uh, met a woman named Sherry who was also multiple, um, but hadn't figured it out yet. Like she was, you know, she'd be losing time and switching personalities, but hadn't put two and two together yet. And so um, Michael tried to help her. And, uh, I, you know, it was just it was just this thing about this this relationship between two people with multiple personalities and this real life story. And I thought, geez, that. That would make a really interesting novel. Um, and so there I just, you know, did a lot of reading and, and came up with a, a way to tell that story. So um, but so sometimes it's, yeah, sometimes it's a f more fully fledged idea, but a lot of times it's just a, a bunch of different ideas bouncing around in my head or I'll have a, a larger frame like – I'm, I'm one of the things I've, I've been wrestling with for a while. I, I got interested in roller derby and I came up with this weird idea for telling a story about a, a former roller derby team getting caught up in a, a, a contest to be the first people to land on another planet. <laughs> so I've got this I've got this sort of basic frame for how it starts and where it goes. But there's big chunks in the middle like it's that aren't there yet. So it's just going to bounce around in my head maturing and then there'll there'll probably be this totally unrelated other idea that I'll come up with and I'll realize, hey, if I slot this in here, suddenly I've got a, a complete novel that I can do something with. Um so a lot of it's yeah, just you, you get these ideas and you file them away. Wouldn't it be curious to do something with this bit of business or this bit of business and file them away in my back brain and and you know, at some point something shakes loose and I'm like, okay, yeah, that one's ready to go now. That's so so awesome. Um, the, the new book, um, 88 Names, uh, what was it that, um, that, that inspired this book? What was it? Uh, are, well, first off, are you uh, an online gamer and uh, yeah. how, how familiar <laughs> were you with this world when this story came alive? I'm, I'm laughing because, yes, I, I've spent way too much time playing video games in my life. So yeah, this, this grew in part out of a, a lifelong love of gaming and not just, not just video gaming. I'm, I'm a board gamer from way back too. when I was, um, when I was 12, I was a play tester for a war games company in Manhattan called simulations publications incorporated that, you know, so I, 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 that was like being a kid in a candy store. And, um, I was introduced to computer games while I was working there too, because the company had, you know, uh, a, a mini computer that you could, you could play a, a text based Star Trek game on. So, um, but fortunately for me, you know, I, I until very recently did not have the money for, um, you know, the, the latest, the most up to date computer technology. So, um, and that became particularly important around the turn of the century when people figured out how to put Dungeons and Dragons online and created the massive multiplayer online role playing game, which is, you know, it's, it's like an alternate lifestyle if you want to commit to it. Um, and I was fascinated by the idea, but I didn't have the, the bandwidth at the time to actually participate. So I would just read about, um, these online games and, one of the things I discovered in my reading was that there was this phenomenon called gold farming where um, people would play, you know, the, these games and, and sort of accumulate virtual loot like gold pieces or magical items or armor. 
and then sell them to other players for real money. And uh, this was really a booming business at the, particularly at the start of the the online role playing game era, where people were spending sometimes hundreds of dollars for these rare virtual items. Um, and it, it created a really weird situation for the game companies because they were kind of annoyed that people were making money off their IP without, you know, the sanction. And, and also it creates customer service problems because if somebody got burned on a deal, they would they would call up the company and complain. And the company would have to explain, look, these guys don't work for us. We can't help you. Um, so I came up with this idea. I thought, geez, it would be interesting to tell a story of, about a gold farmer. Um and again, that was just sort of a larval notion that that I hung on to. And then over time, it evolved in, into an idea of uh, instead of a gold farm or something called a Sherpa, which would be um, someone who didn't just sell virtual items, but would actually, you know, sell adventures. So if you if you were a rich person and you wanted to play the, you know, the futuristic version of World of Warcraft, you could hire a Sherpa to you know, get you a high level character ready made with, you know, cool weapons and armor and assemble a team of experienced players and basically cater an adventure for you. It's, you know, it's sort of like the the role playing game version of climbing Everest. And um, and I thought, you know, yes, and I'll set this far enough in the future that virtual reality is is finally become a mature technology. And that's when it started to get interesting because I realized, OK, if I set it in VR, then uh, I'll be telling a story where the characters, you know, interact online and they they don't see each other as they actually are in real life. They see each other as they choose to present themselves. So, you know, you meet up with somebody and you if, you know, if they tell you their real name, you can look them up on social media. But un unless you meet them in the flesh, you can't really be sure who you're really dealing with. It's like, you know, is it is this really a man? Is it you know, are they really speaking English or are they using a translator? You know, um, and so from there, I, yeah, I came up with this idea of this this Sherpa named John Chu, who uh, makes a living in this sort of gray market, black market of of uh, catering to people who want to play online role playing games. And one day he gets a new client um, who goes by the name of Mr. Jones, who claims to be a wealthy, famous individual with powerful enemies. So and because of these enemies, he he can't reveal his true identity. But he's willing to pay $100,000 a week for a comprehensive tour of the world of virtual reality gaming. And so, you know, John Chu takes the job, but obviously he's curious. And as the, the tour begins, he begins to suspect that Mr. Jones is actually the North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un, who's interested in, in VR entertainment for reasons that have more to do with propaganda than, uh, than you know, entertainment value. Um, and what I thought was fun about this is that, you know, it, it, again, it's, it's the first two thirds of the novel are set entirely online in either virtual reality game worlds or virtual chat rooms or other virtual environments. So everyone that my protagonist is interacting with, not just Mr. Jones, but his coworkers and you know, even his ex-girlfriend are people he's never actually met in real life. And, um, and again, you know, you can, you can, try to investigate people on social media, but social media is unreliable as well. So it's this constant guessing game of who he's really dealing with and, and what their real motivations are. And that was just a wonderful sandbox to play in and allowed me to do a lot of things, not just about gaming, but about the the sort of weird pathologies that have been spawned by, you know, this life we're all spending way too much online in. Right. Um, and, and the, I, I can only imagine as you start thinking about this and, and man, this is, uh, if I do this, this is going to open up these possibilities and, and just the, the, the sheer craziness, you know, is, is kind of off the charts of, of what is possible. I mean, you know, with, uh, including real life dictators, I mean, anything is, is, you know, nothing is, uh, out of reach, I guess, um, but all of that doesn't mean anything if we don't care about John Chu. Um, mm -hmm. How did you go about connecting with him and uh, kind of what are the things that enamored uh, you to John Chu? Well, I mean, I think the thing is one of the things I wanted to do, I mean, this is, you know, obviously on, on one level, this is a novel about video games and there's a built in audience for that. But I didn't I, I, I 
I wanted to appeal to as wide an audience as possible, and I wanted to make it as accessible and interesting to non gamers as I could. And um, because it's it's also just about character relationships, and that was very important to me. So um, with John Chu, I mean, the, the thing about him is he's 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 basically a small businessman. So a lot of, a lot of the appeal of him is that this is a guy trying to make a living in, you know, in this, again, it's, it's sort of not quite black market, but kind of gray market. Um, he's constantly trying to make rent and he's, you know, so he's got this opportunity, what seems like a too good to be opportunity, true opportunity to sort of up his game and, and make a lot of money. And I think that's a, a situation that a lot of people can identify with. And, you know, is he's, he's a struggling business person. Um, and you know, from there, I, I tried to deal with his, you know, his relationships with his coworkers and the difficulties of, of keeping, you know, these sort of squabbling coworkers from, you know, keeping this team together. And then at the same time dealing with this big mystery of, you know, have I gotten into bed with a dictator? Um, so there's a lot you can do with that in terms of just keeping people interested. And then in the individual game set pieces, the action set pieces in the novel, I try to make sure that there's always more going on there than, you know, it's not just, you know, this is, this is the, my, my tale of my favorite world of Warcraft session. It's like all that cool stuff is in there, but at the same time, every set piece has other things about advancing the plot or, uh, you know, telling you something about the characters. Um, so yes, you know, Maybe we're, you know, we're out in space fighting a big space battle, but at the same time, you know, John Chu is trying to use the game mechanics to sort of trick Mr. Jones into revealing whether he's really North Korean, um, or I'll be using some other game session to tell you, you know, how John Chu met his ex-girlfriend and, and, you know, how it started to go wrong and, you know, things like that. So I, there's always more going on, um, uh, so that was, that was what I was trying to do. And it, it, he was just a fun character. He's sort of, he's similar to me in that, um, as a writer, I'm always trying to imagine myself into other people's headspaces. And part of the joy of fiction for me is that I, I get to explore other people's worldviews and, and, you know, the lives of people who are very different from me in a lot of ways. And John Chu has a similar motivation in his case, because he, you know, uh, if you, you want to be a successful salesperson, you, you've kind of got to understand where your customers are coming from. You have to know what they want so you can figure out how to give them that to get, get what you want from them. So uh, in the name of commerce, John Chu is this, he's constantly profiling the people he's dealing with, trying to figure out, okay, you know, how can I give you what you want so I can get what I want? And, and it's, it's kind of a, a variation on my job. So that, that too was a, a way to get into the character and, and have some fun. Absolutely. Um, with with your book, um, eighty eight names. Uh, this is such a fun world to uh, to you know to jump in and to kind of imagine um, how uh, a, a situation like this could become real. I, I remember you know when when Ready Player One first came out and and people were loving that Ernie Klein book and the world that he created. Um, you know there there are elements of what we have now. Um, and, and, you know, thinking how that scales up to, um, to a place where more and more people become, uh, involved and it becomes part of everyday life. Well, a lot of us are, uh, at home, uh, you know, locked down, uh, now with the coronavirus stuff going on. And, you know, there are companies that are looking to, uh, online gaming to, to understand, um, you know, the, uh, the technologies of scale to connect people, uh, the way gaming has been doing for, you know, a, a couple of decades now. Um, and it's, it's kind of becoming easier to see how we can all become connected in, uh, in these online, uh, worlds. How, how, when, when you're writing this and imagining this world and, um, you know, the situations and the technologies, um, how far away do you, did you and, and do you now feel that we are from uh, living in a world like this? I mean, I, I I kind of I never give a specific date in the novel, but you can sort of work it out that it's it's probably set about twenty years in the future. And 
Um, that may be conservative in terms of how long it takes because uh, it, it basically comes down to processing power and bandwidth. Um, I um, I purposely did not spend a lot of time using real VR before I wrote the book because it I, I didn't want to get bogged down in too much in the technology. Like the the, the concept is like no that VR works and. If we assume that, you know, that the dream has finally been realized and you can do this sort of, you know, these photorealistic virtual environments, um, what would that be like? Um, after the after I finished writing it, I, I sort of rewarded myself by buying an Oculus headset and spending some time messing around with that. And um, I'm, I was sort of pleasantly surprised that, you know, we're not there yet. It's still early days, but the, the technology is already pretty impressive. And... Um, and, and one of the nice side effects of this is I, I've been I was invited to do um, my first ever interview in virtual reality that that was earlier this month um, on a, something called the the Drax Files Radio Hour, um, which is based in Munich. But um, really, it's it's takes place in Sansar, which is the VR version of Second Life. And um, so, you know, I was able to just put on goggles here in Seattle and. My host, you know, put on his goggles in in Germany, and then we met in this imaginary room. Um, and uh, I, I, it was fun. I got to, I had a custom avatar. I basically attribute to my novel Bad Monkeys. I was basically a talking mandrel, um, and we were able to. Um, we had shirts that were, you know, uh, sort of virtual merchandise. They were basically uh, shirts referencing um, fictional games from within 88 names. And um, there are, on the table between us were all of these mock-ups of my novels. So it was just a really interesting experience because it, it made me realize, yeah, this is, this is further along than I would have expected. And, uh, it's it's still glitchy. There are still definitely you know there's it's there's still definitely things that need to be fixed. But I could see one or two generations further along, this could become a very useful tool for uh, even when we're not all sheltering in place in our homes to to sort of bring people together from different parts of the world on very short notice and really make you feel as if you're there. I mean, it, it, it's not like teleconferencing because in this case, it's like you're you really feel like you're in the same room with somebody and it again, it can, it can look like anything. Um, so, and, and again, the, the, the scale of the graphics, it's definitely cartoonville at this point. Um, they're going to need more bandwidth and more processing power until it gets to the point where it looks like you're in a physical room. But, um, particularly if there's a hunger for this, which I think there will be once the technology gets a little better, I think they will find ways to find that bandwidth and that's, that's going to be amazing. So, yeah, for sure. The new book, 88 Names, um, Matt, the, the title of this book uh, is a little provocative. Can you give listeners a, a hint as to what 88 Names refers to? I, I mean, the, the, the part of it is just the idea that because these, these Sherpas are, you know, technically violating the terms of service by engaging in unsanctioned commerce in the game world. So they're, they're constantly – being pursued by the in-game EULA police, the the enforcers of the end-user license agreement, and uh, if they catch you hiring a Sherpa or working as a Sherpa, they will ban you. Um, so uh, Sherpas, of course, take this in stride. It's just you know, it's 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 like the supermarkets where a certain amount of you know pickle jars are going to get broken. You just factor that into your bottom line. So. Uh, one account gets banned, you have another account. And so, yeah, John Chu has 88 names. He's got multiple accounts that he can, one gets gets wiped out, he just switches to another one. And as long as he's making enough money, he can keep doing this. Um, and then it just, it, but it also refers to the, the, the fact that, again, you never know who you're dealing with or, you know, uh, people can wear multiple faces online and, and pass themselves off as different people. So, that's another part of it is just this constant guess of, you know, who, who am I really dealing with and, you know, and, and what do they want? Right. And remember, folks, uh, before just clicking uh, to agree to that EULA, be sure to read those. Yeah. You never know when, <laughs> you never know when the EULA police are going to show up. Now, now that you have lots of time, you right. can read those really long documents. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, the, the new novel is called 88 Names. There's links to it in the show notes of this episode. Uh, if you are stuck at home in your favorite bookstore, 
uh, is closed right now. Um, I've been recommending people go grab the audiobook. It's on Audible right now. Uh, it's fantastic. It's amazing. You can listen to an audiobook clip, uh, a, a sample there. Uh, and then, you know, when you're saving all this gas money from going nowhere, uh, when the bookstores open back up, go grab the hardcover for yourself. Uh, there, the, but there are links in the show notes where you can get the audiobook or uh, Amazon, the Kindle edition. Uh, Matt, if people are intrigued by you and want to dig into all the great stuff that you do, is there a place Not online where they can connect time. with you? That's yes, amazing. my website is uh, www.bymattruff.com. That's B-Y-M-A-T-T-R-U-F-F.com. So like a byline. Um, and uh, it, I, I didn't listen to my mother-in-law when she told me to just grab mattruff.com. So I had to uh, – some because I thought – how many people could have that name? And it turns out quite a few. So yeah, so it's yeah. So I had to go with the byline. So uh, well, we'll put links to that in the show notes as well. Uh, Matt, I'm a huge fan, and uh, I love getting to talk with you. We're going to send everyone to pick up a copy of 88 Names, and um, uh, we wish you much success with the new release. Well, thank you very much, and thanks for having me on. Stay tuned now for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Fox's The Ember War near future. The probe slowed as the sun's heliosphere disrupted the graviton wave it rode in on from the abyss of deep space. Awakened by the sudden deceleration, the probe absorbed the electromagnetic spectrum utilized by its target species and assessed the technological sophistication of the sole sentient species on Earth. The probe adjusted its course to take it into the system's primary. If the humans couldn't survive, with its help, what was to come, then the probe would annihilate itself. There would be no trace of it for the enemy, and no chance of humanity's existence beyond the time it had until the enemy arrived. The probe analyzed filed patents, military expenditures, birth rates, mathematical advancement, and space exploration. The first assessment fell within the margin of error of survival and extinction for humanity. The probe's programming allowed for limited, autonomous decision-making, choice being a rare luxury for the probe's class of artificial intelligence. The probe found itself in a position to choose between ending its mission in the sun's fire and a mathematically improbable defense of humanity and the potential compromise of its much larger mission. Given the rare opportunity to make its own decision, the probe opted to dither. In the week it took to pass into Jupiter's orbit, the probe took in more data. It scoured the Internet for factors to add to the assessment, but the assessment remained the same. Unlikely, but possible. By the time it shot past Mars, the probe still hadn't made a decision. As the time to adjust course for Earth or continue into the sun approached, the probe conducted a final scan of cloud storage servers for any new information and found something interesting. While the new information made only a negligible impact on the assessment, the probe adjusted course to Earth. It hadn't traveled all this way for nothing. In the desert south of Phoenix, Arizona, it landed with no more fanfare than a slight thump and a few startled cows. Then it broke into the local cell network and made a call. Mark Ibarra awoke to his phone ringing at max volume, playing a pop ditty that he hated with vehemence. He rolled off the mattress that lay on the floor and crawled on his hands and knees to where his cell was recharging. His roommate, who paid the majority of their rent and got to sleep on an actual bed, grumbled and let off a slew of slurred insults. Mark reached his cell and slapped at it until the offending music ended. He blinked sleep from his eyes and tried to focus on the caller's name on the screen. The only people who'd call at this ungodly hour were his family in Bosque country, or maybe Jessica in his applied robotics course wanted a late-night study break. The name on the screen was Answer Me. He closed an eye 
and reread the name. It was way too early, or too late, depending on one's point of view, for this nonsense. He turned the ringer off and went back to bed. Sleep was about to claim him when the phone rang again, just as loudly as last time, but now with a disco anthem. Seriously? His roommate slurred. Mark declined the call and powered the phone off. He flopped back on his bed and curled into his blanket. To hell with my first class, he thought. Arizona State University had a lax attendance policy, one which he'd abused for nights like this. The cell erupted with big band music. Mark took his head out from beneath the covers and looked at his phone like it was a thing possessed. The phone vibrated so hard that it practically danced a jig on the floor, and the screen flashed Answer Me over and over again as music blared. Dude, said his roommate, now sitting up in his bed. Mark swiped the phone off the charging cord, and the music stopped. The caller's name undulated with a rainbow of colors, and an arrow appeared on the screen, pointing to the button he had to press to answer the call. When did I get this app? He thought. Mark sighed and left the bedroom, meandering into the hallway bathroom with the grace of a zombie. The battered mattress he slept on played hell with his back and left him stiff every morning. Dropping his boxers, he took a seat on the toilet and answered the call, determined to return this caller's civility with some interesting background noise. What? he murmured. Mark Ibarra, I need to see you. The voice was mechanical, asexual in its monotone. Do you have any friggin' idea what time it is? Wait, who the hell is this? You must come to me immediately. We must discuss the mathematical proof you have stored in document title This Can't Be Right dot doc. Mark shot to his feet. The boxers around his ankles tripped him up, and he stumbled out of the bathroom and fell against the wall. His elbow punched a hole in the drywall, and the cell clattered to the floor. He scooped the phone back up and struggled to breathe as a sudden asthma attack came over him. <laughs> how? How? He couldn't finish his question until he found his inhaler in the kitchen mere steps away in the tiny apartment. He took a deep breath from the inhaler and felt the tightness leave his lungs. That someone knew of his proof was impossible. He'd finished it earlier that night, and had encrypted it several times before loading it into a cloud file that shouldn't have been linked to him in any way. How do you know about that? he asked. You must come to me immediately. There is little time. Look at your screen the robotic voice said. His screen changed to a map program, displaying a pin in an open field just off the highway, connecting Phoenix to the suburb of Maricopa. Come. Now. Mark grabbed his keys. An hour later, his jeans ripped from scaling a barbed wire fence, Mark was surrounded by desert scrub. The blue of the morning rose behind him, where his beat-up Honda waited on the side of the highway. With his cell to it... Some things you write now, uh, do they differ in the writing process from... Uh, from Plants looked a lot like benign mesquite trees in the darkness. A Native American casino in the distance served as his north star, helping him keep his bearings. You're not out here, are you? I'm being punked, aren't I? He asked the mysterious caller. You are 9.26 meters to my east-southeast. Punk. Decayed wood. Used as tinder. Are you on fire? The caller said. Mark rolled his eyes. This wasn't the first time the caller had used the non-standard meanings of words during what passed as conversation between the two. Mark had tried to get the caller to explain how he knew about his theorem and why they had to meet in the middle of the desert. The caller had refused to say anything. 
He would only reiterate that Mark had to come quickly to see him, chiding him every time Mark deviated from the provided driving directions. If you're so close, why can't I see you? He asked. He took a few steps in what he thought was a northwesterly direction and squished into a cow patty.